Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. Question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and for the opportunity for each party to make some remarks about D-Day. Eighty years ago today, British soldiers joined those from America, Canada and other nations to board planes, ships and landing craft to begin the liberation of Europe. The men who were parachuted into Normandy or landed at Gold, Juno, Sword, Omaha or Utah beaches on the 6th of June headed into danger and uncertainty. They were met with mines, barbed wires and the guns of the German defenders. 4,414 of the men involved in Opportune Neptune alone would lose their lives. But their sacrifice and the brave efforts of all those individuals on that historic day played a key part in the downfall of Nazism and ensuring the freedom and democracy for Western Europe. On this day, the 80th anniversary, and as the veterans of that day become fewer and fewer, and the event passes from memory to history, our need to remember their heroism becomes ever more important. So today and always, we will remember them. Thank you. Could I ask the Deputy First Minister, does she agree that granting new oil and gas licences for the North Sea is essential not only for our energy security, but to protect tens of thousands of jobs here in Scotland? Deputy First Minister. Well, can I start, presiding officer, by echoing Douglas Ross's comments. Today is a day for a reflection on the sacrifice and the bravery of all those who served during the Second World War especially those who made the ultimate sacrifice and laid down their lives for us in pursuit of a better world. And the youthful faces that we have seen in the photographs this morning with the TV coverage stay with us and have certainly reminded me of my loved ones. Were it not for the courageous actions of those brave men and women, we would not enjoy the freedoms which we now take for granted including the freedom to debate and disagree this very afternoon. We owe them a huge debt of gratitude. And as we mark the 80th anniversary of D-Day today, we will never forget those who have and continue to lay down their lives in the service of their country, and we will never take our freedoms for granted. Well, Presiding Officer, we are absolutely crystal clear in our support for a just transition for Scotland's oil and gas sector, which recognises the declining nature of the North Sea Basin and is in line with our climate change commitments. Because the difference between this party and the Conservatives is that we will never abandon our workers, yep. we will never leave a legacy of inequality, yep. and we will never destroy communities like the Tories did in the last transition. Any Any further extraction must be consistent with our climate obligations and we must approach licensing on a rigorously evidence-led, case-by-case basis with robust climate compatibility and energy security being key considerations. Douglas Ross may not care, care very much for doing the hard work to understand yeah. the evidence of decisions, yeah. as he confessed earlier this week with Liz Truss's budget, but we yeah. are evidence-led and we will ensure our decisions on North Sea oil and gas are consistent with the evidence. Yeah. Douglas Ross. Well, the evidence, the evidence is very clear. The SNP plans to be against any new oil and gas licences will see tens of thousands of jobs lost in the North Sea and the North East. That's the evidence. That is very clear. Now, the Deputy First Minister also said this this week. She said about the SNP, and I quote, have never said no to new oil and gas licences. But, of course, they opposed the Rosebank field. They opposed Campbell. And let's just hear what one of her government colleagues has said. Mary McCallum, the Cabinet Secretary for Energy, said clearly the Scottish Government, and I quote the Energy Secretary's words, do not agree with the UK Government issuing new oil and gas licences. How can the SNP even pretend to support the oil and gas sector and the jobs that are crucial to it when their own Energy Secretary says that? 
Deputy First Minister. Very difficult to believe the Tories on oil and gas when we know that Douglas Ross's party has been exploiting Scotland's yeah. oil and gas yeah. to fill their budget holes for decades. Yeah. And what's got Scotland got to show for it? Austerity, Brexit. Yeah and the cost of living crisis. We've never proposed a policy of no further North Sea licensing at all. We have said no. quite clearly that it has to be compatible with our climate change obligations. And any licensing process has to be subject to a robust climate compatibility checkpoint. But Douglas Ross wants to talk about evidence. The scientific evidence is clear. There is an urgent need to transition away from fossil fuels globally if the Paris Agreement climate goals are to be met. And our focus is on meeting our energy needs, reducing emissions and ultimately delivering affordable energy. Yeah, Douglas yeah. Ross. The Deputy First Minister didn't want to listen to the Conservatives on this. I was simply quoting her Cabinet colleague. The Scottish Government, the SNP Cabinet Secretary for Energy, says we do not agree with the UK Government issuing new oil and gas licences. That's not me saying that. That is the SNP's Energy Secretary. And if the Deputy First Minister is trying to distance herself from those comments, there's more. Here's Hamza Youssef, the SNP leader until just last month. He said, and I quote, I don't think it was the right thing to do to grant 100 new licences. The SNP leader before that, Nicola Sturgeon, says, I don't think we can continue to give the go-ahead to new oil fields. And several times just this week, I asked John Swinney directly if the SNP backed new oil and gas licences. He wouldn't give a straight answer. So here's an opportunity for the Deputy First Minister. Does the SNP Scottish Government agree that new oil and gas licences for the North Sea should be granted, yes or no? Deputy First Minister. Country, I have been very clear in yeah. our approach, and our approach is that Consistent. we will continue to support yeah. the workers, we will continue to support the industry in line with our climate change obligations, and the industry itself it, believes in that transition. It, but the facts speak for themselves in terms of what we are doing. Last month alone, we saw progress of two significant projects that will drive forward our energy transition and underline our position as an energy powerhouse. The groundbreaking on Sumitomo's £350 million high voltage direct current cable factory and the investment that was made eh, through Haventus in the redevelopment of Ardisi Airport. That's because this government believes in a just transition, a transition that does not leave the workers behind, that does not turn the taps off overnight, but is very conscious of our climate change eh, obligations. And we've heard a lot of figures this week that have been cooked up by the Tories, yeah. and the bottom line for us is that we are led by the evidence and we will always back the North East and Scottish workers. Yeah. Dr. Shaw. People might not have realised listening to that answer, I'd simply ask the Deputy First Minister, yes or no, do the SNP agree with the granting of new oil and gas licences? And we got nothing, no answer whatsoever about that specific question. So let me be clear. The Scottish Conservatives support new oil and gas licences because new developments will protect jobs in the north east of Scotland, but they will also support the just transition to net zero. They will keep bills down, they will prevent us having to import costly oil from foreign countries, and they will secure Scotland's energy future. Now, they are trying to pretend otherwise, presiding officer. But the SNP are against new oil and gas licences, regardless of the impact on workers affected. And if we're speaking about evidence, I go back again to the Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce. They said in a report that the position to not grant new oil and gas licences would put 100,000 jobs at risk. So, Deputy First Minister, why are the SNP ignoring them? Deputy First Minister. I think Douglas Ross might find that the same report had some criticisms uh, for the Conservatives yes. as well. But yeah. uh, Douglas Ross talks about supporting uh, the North East, and I've been very clear about our position of uh, new licences. But of course, if Douglas Ross wants to back the North East, there's some great big questions for him yeah. uh, this very day, on a day that he betrays a Conservative candidate yeah. in the North East, yeah. who they're yeah. 
who the Conservatives trusted to be a minister in the UK government, who is currently recovering from ill health, who was planning to stand members. for election, and who was supported by local members. Now, I am old enough to remember when Douglas Ross said he wasn't going to stand again for Westminster because he wanted to focus on Holyrood in 2026. Our position is clear. We will back the North East, we will back workers, and we intend on achieving our climate change aims. Yeah. Question number two, Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, I share the sentiments of the Deputy First Minister and Douglas Ross on this day, the 80th anniversary of D-Day. It is right that we commemorate all those Scottish, British and Commonwealth soldiers who made the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom and liberty in Europe. We will remember them. On Sunday, it was revealed that the SNP will effectively hand back up to half a billion pounds of funding that should have been spent on crucial economic and anti-poverty projects across Scotland. That is simply a scandal. And it happened when Kate Forbes was Finance Secretary. Yeah. 158 million already handed back because of SNP failure to meet annual expenditure targets. A further 136 million not spent by the deadline of the end of 2023. And a further 280 million still to be claimed. All confirmed today by the Indian independent experts at the Scottish Parliament. And this is just the latest example of SNP financial incompetence. So can the Deputy First Minister tell me how the SNP has made such a mess of this? Deputy First Minister. The member quite clearly today quoting from that very same Spice report uh, that they could not find evidence for the £450 million pound claim. Uh, we said that very clearly earlier this week uh, and the Spice uh, report uh, also indicates um, that that £450 million pound is not one uh, that they recognise. The points about uh, this uh, story are clear. First of all, final expenditure figures will not be known until the programme formally closes in 2025. To have spent all the money a year in advance, I think, would raise questions itself. Secondly, we do not expect the final figures to be markedly different from elsewhere in the UK or indeed from previous programmes. So our commitment is to spend uh, as much of the money as possible. And of course, the irony of the question is that the Labour Party have no intention of ever returning yeah. Scotland yeah. to Europe yeah. and therefore depriving us of European yeah. funding yeah. indefinitely. Yeah. Yeah. Becky Bailey. Do you know what's interesting is the clawback in Scotland is going to be greater than anywhere else in the UK. The 28% is likely to be the scale of return in Scotland. In Wales, it's 9%. In England, 6%. In Northern Ireland, 2%. Can I, can I gently as possible tell Kate Forbes that I used to oversee EU structural funds. So I know how the claims work and I know the life-changing impact the money can have and I do not buy her excuses for one second because this comes down to the financial incompetence of this SNP government at a time when people are crying out for help Members. during a cost of living crisis and our public services are stripped to the bone. It is unforgivable that the SNP are wasting taxpayers' money. And the scale of the incompetence goes even further, presiding officer. New analysis published by the Scottish Labour Party today reveals the SNP... Oh, wait for it, wait for it. Reveals that the SNP has wasted £5 billion since they came to office. That includes agency Members. spend costing the NHS over £1.6 billion, delayed discharge costing over £1.3 billion, ferries now £330 million over budget, and the list goes on. Question Given the Ms. real Bailey. challenges in the country, can the Deputy First Minister explain to the people of Scotland why the SNP is wasting their money? Because that is utterly indefensible. Deputy First Minister. What is indefensible is that the party pretending to offer change is shortchanging yes. Scotland yeah. by adopting Conservative budget rules. Yeah. We know that under the Conservatives' budget, there was a proposed £19 billion cut to UK public services. And to quote another Labour spokesperson, 
all roads lead back to Westminster. And therefore, there is profoundly difficult choices ahead if the Labour Party continue with their plans of adopting Tory rules. Rachel Reeves has said that there is no more money. She's made a virtue of that. And when you look at the money coming to the NHS alone, it's less than what the yeah. Conservatives yeah. were promising. Yeah. When yeah. it comes to the Scottish Government's position on the budget, we look at the EU structural funds, look at the projects that have benefited from it. From the Highlands to the Lowlands, there has been significant benefit. We will continue to maximise the funding that is available to ensure that we tackle child poverty, grow the economy and meet net zero. Yeah. Thank you, Bailey. Well, that was a desperate response from the Deputy First Minister. She had no answer for the £5 billion of waste generated under her watch. And she knows that she is misleading this chamber because there will be no return to austerity under Labour. Do you know, her attack is Members. straight out of the Tory playbook. Members. And is she not aware that the people of Scotland can see right through that very desperate spin from the SNP? People are tired of the chaos, they're tired of the sleaze, they're tired of SNP politicians not treating Scottish taxpayers' money with respect. Failing to use millions of pounds isn't treating the taxpayer with respect. Wasting £5 billion of public money isn't treating the taxpayer with respect. Defending Michael Matheson and his £11,000 iPad bill isn't treating the taxpayer with respect. People across Scotland are sick of the SNP putting party before country and sick, sick of the financial incompetence that they end up paying for. Last year, I question Ms. attacked Hamza Youssef, saying that continuity wouldn't cut it. But she seems to have failed to learn her own lesson, because all we have heard today is more of the same. Members. Is it any wonder? that the people of Scotland are crying out for change from 14 years of Tory chaos and 17 years of SNP Thank you, Ms Bailey, Deputy First Minister. Crying out for change and they're not going to get it with Labour, yeah. that is for sure. Yeah. And, and let me start with a point of consensus that I think the public do want to be treated with respect and they are tired of spin. And Labour have spent this week accusing the Conservatives of spinning numbers. And that's precisely why I think there's the air of hypocrisy right now in terms of the figures that Jackie Bailey has come to this chamber with. Because at the end of the day, Labour have to answer a question from the Institute for Fiscal Studies. They have said that Labour are effectively signing up to sharp spending cuts. Mm -hmm. They need to have an answer to that, and I have not heard one uh, yet. And Deputy the the First day, Minister, I am aware of several contributions on an ongoing basis from these benches. I'd be grateful if you could desist. Deputy First Minister. And at the end of the day, we are proud of our record because our most recent budget using progressive taxation has seen the Scottish child payment increase, has seen the best performing A&E in this country, has delivered for business in terms of slashing or abolishing rates for businesses and has made Scotland the top destination outside London for foreign direct investment. That is a record to be proud of, but it would be a lot easier to deliver these game-changing policies if we didn't have Tory austerity and repeat. Yeah. Question number three, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And as we commemorate the 80th anniversary of D-Day, I've found myself reflecting on a particular evening of the 2016 election campaign when I knocked a door not too far from here, and that door was answered by a 96-year-old gentleman who invited me in to admire his collection of bagpipes. Not only that, but he taught me my first ever bagpipe lesson. What blew me away was that those were the pipes that he'd used to bring the troops ashore at Sword Beach in Normandy on D-Day 80 years ago. I reflect on his memory, and sadly he has passed away now, and all too many veterans have. This may be the last time we commemorate an anniversary with people who were actually there uh, to commemorate it with us. We reflect on their sacrifice on the altar of freedom and the cause of democracy and uh, against the tyranny of Nazism, and we will remember them. To ask the uh, Deputy First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. Tuesday. First Minister. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful for that reply. Presiding Officer, in the early hours of 5th July 2015, John Yule and Lamara Bell were returning from a camping trip when their car left the road on the M9. The police were alerted to the crash but didn't turn up for three days. All the while, 
Lamara was still alive, trapped, calling for help. She may have survived if help had arrived sooner. In the weeks beforehand, my party had been warning about the chaos in the call centre at Bilston Glen, caused by the rushed centralisation of the police by the SNP government. John Swinney was Deputy First Minister at the time. The fatal accident inquiry system is so broken that it has taken nine years to report on the deaths of John and Lamara, with final conclusions only published last week. Will the Deputy First Minister accept that her government has failed on two counts? First, the botched centralisation that contributed to this tragedy in the first place, and second, the intolerable wait for answers the families have had to endure. To First Minister. Well, can I start by expressing my deepest sympathies to the families and friends of Lamar Bell and John Yule. When the situation happened, the former Justice Secretary also was quite clear in his statement to Parliament following the court ruling, um, our deepest apologies, and the former Chief Constable has also unreservedly apologised to the families, and I repeat that uh, this afternoon. In terms of the points that uh, Alex Cole Hamilton has raised, I think it's important that we start by looking at the lessons that have been learned, because all the recommendations of Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary's independent review into Police Scotland's con uh, uh, Contact Command and Control Division have now been implemented. And I note that the fatal accident inquiry found that lessons have been learned and that the public <coughs> should have confidence in Police Scotland's ability to respond to the calls made. Uh, Alex Cole Hamilton has also made a point on the fatal accident inquiry. Obviously, the conduct of investigations that leads to fatal accident inquiries are a matter for the Lord Advocate and her staff acting independently of government. But I understand that this issue has been raised with the Solicitor General and the Solicitor General has indicated that she is willing to come back to Parliament to answer questions more fully. Thank you. Question number four, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the Deputy First Minister whether the Scottish Government will review the impact of the short-term le licensing legislation in light of the upcoming summer tourist season. Deputy First Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I re uh, refer members to my register of interest uh, in terms of close family members running a BB. and the short-term let licensing scheme is aimed at ensuring that everyone coming to Scotland can be assured of safe, high-quality accommodation. Uh, that is especially important as we approach very busy summer tourist season. We recognise the growth of the short-term let sector and its importance to Scottish tourism. And as a result, hosts have invested in the future of their businesses and are providing assurances to guests on safety and quality. We are already undertaking planned monitoring of the legislation, and we recently laid a statutory amendment which makes technical changes as a result of feedback. And if Parliament approves that amendment, it will further support business activity and clarify exemptions. We will update Parliament in the summer on the scheme's implementation, informed by our ongoing engagement with stakeholders. Christine Graham. Um, I thank the Deputy First Minister for her answer. During the debate on the legislation, I raised concerns about the reach of the regulations, as it includes, for example, yurts, tree houses, and even lighthouses, but also on local pressures for accommodation at times of popular tourist events, such as in my constituency, the Melrose Sevens, the Melrose Boot Festival, and common ridings across the borders. Flexibility to local authorities was, I understand, part of the solution. I understand from what the Deputy First Minister says that the government is more this. Can you advise the Parliament if the flexibility is uh, working? Deputy First Minister. Well, the member makes a very important point, uh, particularly about these very important uh, tourist uh, events locally. And I can confirm that the latest statutory amendment, if approved, provides additional flexibility around the periods that local authorities are able to administer temporary exemptions to the licences, which should hopefully be of use when it comes to these important events. And as Christine Graham has said, uh, that is uh, hugely important. Uh, many authorities have chosen to offer uh, those already. Uh, the Minister for Housing, Paul McLennan, will update Parliament on implementation shortly, which will cover uh, local delivery. But we continue uh, to monitor the implementation of the scheme and take on board any feedback from stakeholders. Miles Briggs. 
Thank you, President Officer. Uh, we can all agree that the rollout of this scheme has certainly not been without its challenges over the last few years. Not my words, but those of the Deputy First Minister to her constituents and businesses in the Highlands. Tourism leaders have been clear that there is irreversible damage being caused by these regulations, something which seems to be falling on deaf ears uh, within the Scottish Government. We need to see changes and we need to see them now. That is why the Housing Minister has not gone far enough and simply demonstrates how badly this legislation was drafted and implemented in the first place. So can I ask the Deputy First Minister to actually act on this today, for Ministers to suspend the legislation until a full review can take place and Parliament can fix the problems this Government has created? Deputy First Minister. Well, the fact that Miles Briggs was able to quote me suggests that I am very actively engaged in the issues and obviously have um, a lot of interest in it locally in my Highland uh, constituency. The point here is that we are very responsive to feedback. We'll continue to engage with stakeholders. And indeed, only two days ago, I had a meeting with the Association of Scottish Self-Caterers to hear about their experience in full. And I'll continue to work with the Housing Minister, who has been exemplary in his engagement, to ensure we take any feedback on board. Thank you. Question number five, Tess White. To ask the Deputy... To ask the Deputy First Minister how the Scottish Government will prevent further GP practice closures in light of reports that the number of surgeries has declined in every NHS board since 2015. Deputy First Minister. Well, GPs are essential to the delivery of high quality, sustainable general practice service, and we remain fully committed to increasing the number of GPs in Scotland by 800 uh, by 2027. To support general practice, we have significantly expanded the primary care multidisciplinary team workforce with over 4,700 staff working in services, um, and we're supporting development of the teams through investment of about £190 million in the primary care improvement fund. Uh, the latest data from Public Health Scotland reflects a trend towards fewer but larger practices that incorporate the multidisciplinary teams to provide a wider range of services. Tess White. Deputy First Minister, you said you were led by evidence. The evidence is GP surgeries in rural Scotland are closing at more than twice the rate of those in many central belt health boards. In NHS Grampian, GPs are damning in their assessment of primary care under this SNP Scottish Government. And here are just some recent direct quotes from GPs to their representative body in NHS Grampian. We had to switch off our phones yesterday for the first time as we have reached our safe limit. We felt we had no option. It feels unmanageable just now. And another said, the current situation cannot continue. Staff are completely exhausted and morale is very low. And somebody else said, another GP said, there has to be an easier way to make a living than this. And I see the Cabinet Secretary talking to you and giving feedback, and I'm glad of that, because we cannot afford to lose more surgeries. Deputy First Minister, GPs and patients across rural communities are watching and listening today. Can we today. have a question, please, what Ms White? What answer can you give them now, because they're at breaking point? Deputy First Minister. Can I start by saying that the question that Tess White asks is very important, uh, because, again, I understand in detail uh, the challenges facing our rural GPs. Uh, but it's precisely because of the challenges around recruitment that we have invested in the pioneering Scott Gem programme. The first cohort is coming through uh, just now. Uh, and we also recognise that there are distinct challenges when it comes to uh, rural and island areas, which is reflected in the budget that has been committed, £3 million for the National Centre for Remote and Rural Health and Care, which was launched in October, is being delivered by NHS Education for Scotland. Um, and you'll also know that we incentivise GPs into taking up rural positions through the £10,000 golden hello scheme and also investing £1 million into bursaries for GP. So where there is agreement is on the pressures facing our rural GPs. The point is that we're taking action right now to try and support them as far as possible because we recognise the importance of our rural GPs. Yeah. Dennis Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Tories have presided over the closure of 450 surgeries, over 1,000 pharmacies, a third of the total, longer waiting lists and strikes by junior doctors and nurses with 40 promised new hospitals unbuilt over the last decade, 
in England. Does the Deputy First Minister agree that the evidence is clear that Scotland's NHS, with all its challenges, is in better shape for both staff and patients under the SNP than it ever would be under the Tories? Deputy First Minister. <laughs> Kenny Gibson is right to talk about the wider context because the situation facing the Scottish NHS has got to be seen in the wider context of the challenges when it comes to visas, the challenges around austerity. And despite that, we're delivering over 19.5 billion pounds of funding for the NHS, health and social care, to give our NHS a real terms uplift and supporting significant investment on the front line. We are committed to the founding principles of the NHS unlike some other parties in yeah. here, and we also want to mitigate against austerity. Yeah. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer. Deputy First Minister, I've been contacted this week by Preston Pan's group practice, the GP surgery in Preston Pan's East Lothian, with concerns about funding, staffing and patient care. They face a withdrawal of funding of 10% from cuts to the East Lothian Health and Social Care Partnership, as well as increased estate fees. This will have an impact on patients. So can I ask the Deputy First Minister, if herself or indeed the Cabinet Secretary, will meet with me to discuss the concerns raised by this group, the whole of the Lothian Local Medical Committee, and indeed how we can improve the situation across the south of Scotland? Deputy First Minister. I have no hesitation in agreeing um, for the Cabinet Secretary for Health to, to meet with Martin Whitfield and his constituents. Question number six, Mark Ruskell. Thank you. To ask the Deputy First Minister by what date the Scottish Government will decide which of the national park nominations will be taken forward to the next stage. Deputy First Minister. Well, the deadline for nominations from areas to be considered for designation as a new national park was the 29th of February this year. Eh, nominations have been received from Galloway, Loch Haber, Loch Awe, Scottish Borders and Tay Forest, and an appraisal process commenced in March 2024. That appraisal process concluded last week, and the Cabinet Secretary, Mary Goujon, is now considering the outcome of that process and will make recommendations shortly. Mark Cruskell. Can I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer? I live in a national park and I see every day how it hugely benefits businesses, communities and nature. And from speaking to local businesses in the stunning Tay Forest area, it is clear that they're looking for certainty about the designation of Scotland's third national park. But the clock is ticking, particularly for the statutory process to complete by 2026. So will Kate Forbes personally ensure that this government leaves a lasting and tangible green legacy for our rural communities by designating at least one new national park ahead of the next Holyrood election. Deputy First Minister. Well, the, the member will know that uh, I don't quite live in a national park, but I represent one. And uh, I do see uh, the benefits, uh, particularly in and around the Cairngorm uh, National Park area. In terms of process, uh, a decision by Cabinet on next steps, steps will be taken over the summer. Um, and of course, uh, the criteria um, that has been uh, finalised for evaluating the national parks uh, is quite clear. It's on outstanding national importance, the size, character and coherence of the area meeting the special needs of the area. It may be that not all the proposals meet the criteria, but that will be a decision that is taken by the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs. Thank you. We move to general and constituency supplementaries, and I call Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In light of the reports about CMAL uh, being merged into our National Ferries Body, what assurances can the Deputy First Minister provide that the CMAL jobs will remain in Port Glasgow Town Centre? Deputy First Minister. Well, when it comes to our ferry network, we absolutely recognise that not only does it provide a, a vital lifeline service, but it also employs people uh, in, in, in areas that are under pressure. Uh, and Stuart McMillan has been um, a, a stalwart in representing his area when it comes to jobs that are related to the ferry network. And I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary for Transport will keep him and others in Parliament informed of any decisions that are made. Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A parliamentary question I submitted has revealed that the SNP Government holds no information on repeat offences for its flagship domestic abuse rehabilitation programme known as the Caledonian System. Deputy First Minister, if the Government do not hold information on reoffending rates, how can it possibly judge how successful this programme is? Deputy First Minister. Well, when 
when it comes to these uh, initiatives and programmes, they are all fully evaluated. And what's important for us is to make sure that it has the, the confidence uh, of victims uh, as well. And that is a key consideration when it comes to the data that is held. And I'm sure if the member is keen to understand uh, some of the thinking behind uh, the decisions that have been made, uh, I'm sure that Angela Constance would be more than happy to meet with her. Paul Keane. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. On Tuesday, the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice stood where the Deputy First Minister is and delivered the annual update on progress to tackle child poverty. What we know is that those levels have been stagnant for 17 years in Scotland and on many measures have increased. The Cabinet Secretary said our action is making a difference. At the same time as that statement, the Poverty and Equality Commission released its annual scrutiny report and they said, in relation to this Government's actions, and I quote, limited progress has been made over the last year, Progress in other areas is slow or not evident at all, and that without immediate and significant action, the Scottish Government will not meet the 2030 targets. The Cabinet Secretary told me that the Government is committed to those targets. So, can I ask the Deputy First Minister, does she agree with the Commission's analysis of her Government's action? And will she tell the Chamber, is the Government going to meet those targets? Well, Deputy First Minister. This Government is very proud of the fact that tackling child poverty is one of its national missions. Yeah. Uh, we take this seriously. It's one of the top priorities of the First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary set out the action that we are taking. This action has resulted in just short of 100,000 children who would have been in poverty yeah. no longer being in poverty. And the yeah. evidence for that is quite clear on an international national basis that the Scottish child payment is game changing it's the only one of its kind uh, in Europe and we want to go as far as possible in lifting children because out of poverty Kevin Stewart Thank you, officer. Um, Whilst Westminster is trashing the UK economy with Brexit, the SNP Scottish Government is prioritising boosting economic growth. It is welcome to see that the latest Bank of Scotland business barometer is showing business optimism in Scotland up by 15 per cent in May to 57 per cent, the joint highest in the UK. Can the Deputy First, First Minister say any more about the steps that the Scottish Government is taking to make Scotland the best place in the UK to do business. Deputy First Minister. That is absolutely our aim and ambition. Scotland is open for business. We are committed to working right across the economy to maximise the huge economic opportunities that lie ahead and not, and not least the incredible renewables energy sector. We want to ensure that our economy remains one of the best performing parts of the UK as it is right now. And we will do that by working in partnership with business, industry and trade unions. Scotland's GDP GDP per capita has grown faster than the UK's since 2007, and a record number of foreign direct investment projects were secured in Scotland in 2022, maintaining our position as the top performing area of the UK outside of London for the eighth year running. Yeah. Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. On the 28th of May 2020, Dwayne McClay and Gary Mackay were both killed and Kimberly Nicholson was violently stabbed in Inverness. The person who carried out the attack had had contact with Police Scotland, NHS Highland, the Highland Council and the Home Office, all of whom have appeared to have followed their own procedures without liaising with each other. Deputy First Minister, I know we can't turn the clock back, but would you be agreeable to meeting with me and the families to try and find ways to ensure information is shared between public bodies regarding vulnerable individuals so that no similar event can occur again. Deputy First Minister. I think that the member makes an important point about uh, engaging with the families and also an important point of constantly looking at ways uh, that public bodies can, can work together. Uh, and so I'm sure that uh, without um, agreeing on Angela Constance's behalf to uh, more meetings than I've agreed to, I think um, she'd be more than happy to meet with uh, Edward Mountain and the families. Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Only 38% of type 1 diabetics in NHS Lothian have access to a flash glucose monitor, compared to 51.8% across Scotland. The divide is even more stark with children, where only a quarter of paediatric patients in NHS Lothian have access to an FGM, compared with 35.5% across Scotland. This technology is life-changing for those who receive it, and type 1s in the Lothians are getting shortchanged. So can I ask the Deputy First Minister 
what her government is doing to increase access to flash glucose monitors across the Lothians. Deputy First Minister. Well, the member is right to say that this treatment can be transformational. Um, and the, the Cabinet Secretary for Health has announced £8.8 million to support the work we're doing around di diabetes and has made the commitment uh, that all children will, with type 1 will get uh, the support that they need. Thank you. And Ross Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I associate the Scottish Greens with colleagues' comments in commemoration of those who made the ultimate sacrifice in Normandy 80 years ago to liberate Europe from fascism? We will remember them. Following the tragic death of a cyclist in March and multiple other serious incidents along the Drimmon and Dentoker Road corridor in Bears Den, a community campaign, Safe Streets Bears Den, has formed to call on Eastern Martinshire Council and other public bodies to take urgent action to protect pedestrians and cyclists. The campaign's highlighted that a number of schools in the area simply don't have safe ways for many other pupils to walk, wheel or cycle in each day. Does the Deputy First Minister agree with me and with Safe Streets Bears Den that action must be taken without delay to address these serious safety concerns along this road and to make Bears Den and Mulgai safer places to walk, wheel and cycle? Deputy First well, Minister. we are absolutely committed to making our streets uh, safer, particularly for young people and particularly in and around schools. So I think uh, Ross Greer makes an absolutely critically important point point. Uh, he also references the fact that local authorities need to be uh, involved because they are on the front line when it comes to delivering uh, safer local streets. Um, but clearly there is funding that has been av made available in this year's uh, budget and we're committed to making sustainable travel a more attractive uh, option. So I'm sure we'll continue to work with Ross Greer in partnership with the local authority to deliver what the community are keen to see. Bob Doris. Presiding officer, the Deputy First Minister earlier mentioned the issue of fiscal studies warnings that Labour and Tory spending plans will mean sharp cuts for public services. Has the Scottish Government given consideration to the impact of these plans on the Scottish Government budget and consequently vital devolved Scottish public services, not least of all our NHS? First Minister. Well, when it comes to the funding that Labour are talking about making available to Scotland's NHS, mm -hmm. it beggars belief that it's actually lower than the yeah. consequentials we received from the Conservative yeah. government. Yeah. Uh, and our priorities will always be to protect Scotland's public services, uh, to mitigate against austerity, but there's only so much we can do. And if it's the IFS saying that Labour and Tory spending plans will mean sharp spending cuts. Mm -hmm. They really need to have an answer for them, not least when Rachel Reeves is saying there will be no more money. Yeah. 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 Jamie Hulker Johnston. Thank you. Well, it seemed as though things might finally be progressing on Sky with NHS Highlands draft plan to restore 24-7 urgent care at Portree Hospital submitted to ministers on the 24th of May. But despite repeated requests, local campaigners still haven't received a copy of the plan, being told it would be explained to them at a meeting which was supposed to take place yesterday but which was cancelled by NHS Highland with less than 24 hours' notice. So will the Deputy First Minister commit to ensuring that the Scottish Government shares the plan with local campaigners immediately? And will she also ensure that the priority of the local community, that 24-7 urgent care is restored at Portree Hospital as soon as possible, is also the priority for NHS Highland and the Scottish Government? Deputy First Minister. Can absolutely agree with the member that restoring 24-7 urgent care at Portree Hospital remains the government's aim and NHS Highland have been crystal clear when it comes to the government's expectations that that is what needs to be delivered. Significant work has happened. The um, NHS Highland submitted their action plan uh, towards the end of May and were very clear with the community that this was about postponing the meeting rather than cancelling it. And I would like to see that meeting happen as quickly as possible to unpack the work that has been done uh, and to give confidence to the community that we do intend to deliver on that recommendation. Yep. MacArthur. Uh, thank you. Last weekend, uh, Orkney's young athletes, um, hockey players, swimmers, footballers and netballers successfully retained the Stuart Cup in the junior inter-county competition against their Shetland counterparts. Will the First Minister join me in congratulating both the Orkney and Shetland athletes <laughs> on, the, on the quality of the competition 
the spirit in which uh, it was played, but also restate the Scottish Government's uh, ongoing support for the International Island Games that will take part in Orkney in 2025. Deputy First Minister. I have no hesitation in joining Liam MacArthur in congratulating uh, the Orkney and, Orkney and Shetland athletes, and I'm sure uh, there was no bias whatsoever in his question <laughs> uh, as he sits next to Beatrice Wishart. Um, I, think that the, the uh, island games, the international island games are wonderful uh, and it really puts the spotlight um, on our island communities and gives our young athletes in these island communities great opportunity. Uh, so I wish them well and I commend what they've achieved. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Mark Ruskell, and there will now be a short suspension to allow those leaving the Chamber and Public Gallery to do so before that item begins.